Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation now in virtual mode, and I guess in virtual mode as far ahead as we can see. One of the things that we have been trying to do is to replicate our old FinTech for breakfast meetings. Well, this isn't breakfast, uh, unless you're watching it early in the morning, but it's the same principle. Jemima Kelly, a reporter from FT Alphaville, who is increasingly prominent as a columnist on the FT itself, is our anchor. Uh, but we have two experts with her to, to back her up and to uh, to fill in the holes. Ludas Canapiensis, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Ondato. Ondato is a compliance uh, based, uh, a, 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 and I quote, a complete and cost-efficient uh, compliance management tool. Um, Ondato was and is, I guess, Lithuanian, but he's just uh, completed a $2 million funding round and he's moving Ondato to London, which is a great success for us post-Brexit. Uh, he was formerly the founder of Pesira, which became a bank in Lithuania, uh, and has a long history of serial, serial entrepreneurships in the tech area. And John Salmon, a partner at Hogan Lovells, he's been a partner there for four years. He was at Pen Pinsent Masons before that. He has been a technology lawyer unbelievably for 20 years, before there even was technology. As usual, our... Um, uh, my, my colleague, Leighton Hughes, will fill in the holes. He and Jemima have worked out a list of what they think are the more important issues for the for this particular month. But let me first of all ask Ludas and John just to give a couple of minutes on what they have been up to and why uh, why what they're, what they're doing is important at the present time. Ludas, Ludas Canapiensis. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. Thank you for a welcome uh, word. and. Uh, so, you know, uh, I also am a kind of a fintech founder and uh, I've started fintech uh, even before the fintech uh, world was founded. And uh, uh, there was a time when everyone was like more focused on, you know, payments, transactions and, and, and this uh, part. Uh, and I was in, into that uh, as well. Uh, and and uh, you mentioned that uh, I was running an uh, electronic money institution at that time that was uh, involving into the challenger bank. Uh, but uh, I realized that uh, FinTech is not about just competing in this uh, financial sector as, as such, but also into uh, going into deeper processes. And that's why we, we started uh, with the co-founding team, we started uh, on Dato uh, with this mission to turn the compliance into the business benefit and to, and to bring that uh, technology uh, into the banking sector as such, and, and and we started with the traditional banks, then extended then uh, that to to challenge the banks and other financial industry with the life insurance companies and all the stuff, and uh, uh, having uh, all the situation you know with Brexit and unclear um, uh, vision on on how it will end, we just came to the decision that uh, we will uh, move the headquarters to UK. Uh, is since it, it always was, it is, and it will be the uh, fintech hub in Europe, uh, whatever shape uh, the, the uh, uh, further communication with, with European Union will be. So, uh, and that, of course, uh, on the other hand, gives us a possibility to build the bridges between the uh, UK and mainland Europe. So, so that's, why, that's why we came there. That's why you've got a bridge in the background. I should have mentioned that your LinkedIn page says that you speak Latin and Russian. I think that's particularly interesting. I'm not quite sure which one is more important. Uh, your LinkedIn page also says that your one of your interests is Justin Trudeau. That made me think a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, John Salmon's uh, LinkedIn page says that one of his interests was Zurich Insurance. And I think <laughs> Insurance and Justin Trudeau I don't know. A lawyer speaks. John, John Salmon, what are you up I, to? I, I've just realized, Andrew, that I really need to update my LinkedIn page. Uh, that, 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 that's a great takeaway for me. So actually, uh, it's nice of you to say that I've been a technology lawyer for 20 years. It's actually almost 30 years, uh, believe it or not. And actually, perhaps pertinent to this discussion, um, it's not always easy to predict the future in technology terms. And when I when I was qualifying as a, from a trainee lawyer in, so this would be, you know, in the very early 90s, 
the partner who I worked for said, I know you like all this technology stuff, John, but you'll never make a career out of it. So <laughs> you maybe need to think about doing something else instead. So uh, anyway, I, but I think the 20 years does does uh, actually um, accord to the, the the amount of time I've actually been doing what's now called FinTech, which um, I, in those days was called tech for financial services companies. But um, so I've been doing that for a long time. I'm kind of really a digital lawyer, but I do basically my work in financial services with fintechs, with big banks, with institutions. Um, I lead our global blockchain and crypto assets practice as quite part of what I do, but it's basically big digital projects and digital, regulate, digital regulation. Um, but I, I am most interested in kind of financial services and fintech -y type stuff. Okay, Jemima, what have you been up to work through your list? Um, work through which list? What I've been up to? Well, you work through the list that you and Leighton have put together, but also tell us what you've been up to. Um, okay. Um, well, what have I been up to? It's been Christmas. I've had Christmas with one person. That was nice. <laughs> um, and uh, other than that, I've been writing about all sorts. I'm actually planning a, um, a piece on Tether and Bitcoin. Um, for next week that will go in into um, the main FT probably next week. So I um, we've got a tether story on the list. So that's one thing I've been um, looking into a bit. Um, I wanted to respond as well to to um, to Ludas because I think actually another thing I've been up to is upsetting many of our readers because I wrote a column last week that um, that suggested that imperial nostalgia is not just something that Brexiteers have and that some Remainers have a slightly, have a kind of vision of Britain having this like soft power in the world, having a seat at the table as like Tony Blair might put it, um, which I don't think is totally unlike having a kind of imperial power. I mean, imperialism wasn't just about gunboats. It was also about like evangelizing and spreading our values and what, you know, why do we currently have so much influence? Isn't it partly because we had an empire? Anyway, now everyone thinks I'm a rampant, rampant Brexiteer having, having written that, which um, I'm not actually, I, I actually voted Remain, but I'm not, I'm not a kind of Ramona and, and actually could see reasons for voting leave, which I, I didn't vote for. But the reason I'm saying that is because I'm, I'm not at all, given that that's my, where I stand or don't stand, I'm not, I, I've, 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 I think even, at CSFI and elsewhere. I'm, I've never really been a kind of Brexit catastrophist. And I think I've said several times at CSFI that it's my belief that, that London will continue to be the fintech capital of Europe, to use that lovely phrase, for the foreseeable future. And unless Ludas is being paid by Rishi Sunak, which he very well might be, <laughs> even what he's just said, I mean, the government must love you. Um, he's kind of just kind of, um, you know, made that clear, like, you know, here's a tech founder who wants to be in London because London just is the fintech capital of Europe. We've got all the things that you might want going for us and they haven't suddenly disappeared because of Brexit. Yes, it might be a bit more difficult um, given that, you know, the passporting rights, which this then are now in a kind of temporary transi transition phase, um, losing those might be might be difficult, um, but it doesn't m suddenly mean that London has like lost all of its edge. So I just wanted to respond to that because I think it's quite interesting. And actually, that's the first story on our list, which we probably don't have to go through now, which is... Well, I'd quite like to ask John's view on it as well, just because it is the first uh, first item yeah. on the list. Are you... Uh, what's your view on, on, on Data's move to London? Does it make sense or did he have to be bribed? <laughs> I, I, I think, well, so, you know, certainly our experience is, you know, I work a lot with Silicon Valley based fintechs, as you can imagine, given the firm that I work for and with, you know, people from all over the world who decide where, where should I start up a fintech. And London's still very attractive for, for all the, the reasons that Luda said. And I completely agree with Jemima. I wasn't personally in favour of Brexit, but now that we've got it, we've got to make the best of it. You know, so um, and actually, if I look at fintech um, and regulation, you know the UK fintech review has 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 just is just about to uh, publish its report. I, I think if we can get the government in the right place, then um, and and listening to the industry, then I think you know London London will prosper. I completely agree with Jemima on that. 
but but we do need to do the right things. Right. Well, let, can, uh, can we just skip one item and go to the UK fintech review and then cover China afterwards? I mean, Jemima, respond to John on the fintech review. Um, yeah, I mean, well, John's probably better place to talk about about all the regulation than I am, but. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly fintech has been placed at the heart of like the, and I think since Cameron, Cameron was extremely like pro fintech. And I think since then, fintech is seen as like a real kind of jewel in the UK's crown of like um, business and emerging kind of innovative business and some, and a way actually of attracting um, talent and investment from other countries. Uh, so, um, yes, yeah, so this um, this story that we've got on the list um, is talking about some some changes to make London or to keep London attractive in a pro post um, Brexit um, world. So this review was was um, um, commissioned by Rishi Sunak in last March's budget, which I think was just it. I think the budget happened. Well, I forgot the exact date in March, but it was pre lockdown, wasn't it? It was, it was just yeah. it was just before yeah yeah it was just as COVID was starting to really happen here but we hadn't quite taken it on board properly i guess um so uh and he he they've it's being led by the um chief executive former chief executive of world pay bron khalifa um and so one of the things that they're talking about is um bringing in different listing rules um so that <clears throat> so that you wouldn't have to um currently the minimum stake that you can float is 25 percent, and they would re reduce that to 10 percent um, which I I have kind of um, mixed mixed feelings about I guess um, the um, so this review is looking at five areas skills and talent investment national connectivity policy and, and international attractiveness and the things it seems to be focusing most most on are the skills and talent and policy I guess in in the sense that they're um, so that they're proposing these listing um, changes the other thing that they're doing is um, uh is is um bringing in this visa um which i've which i've slightly lost now my place what what is the visa that they've john can you help me here oh yes there's special visas for skilled workers yeah. um i've lost my notes that i had on that um well, leighton has a question anyway yeah has yeah a make. Um, leighton. the the easing of listings um and the uh, a little louder leighton closer to the microphone uh, the, the easing of listings and um, the visa are the, the big changes. Um, and I think that the, the listings would sort of factor in um, allowing uh, founders to have a slightly more control over their, um, their listing. But I, I was, I was uh, particularly interested in some data that was just out from Deal Room and London and Partners. And it said that non-European investors accounted for 57% of all tech VC investment into London. Um, and this is just off the back of a big report um, that's put us, we, we have more this year than Berlin and, um, and Paris combined um, in tech VC investment. And I thought it was really encouraging that, you know, 57% of that investment was non-European. Non okay, let me ask Ludas, I mean, to what extent is, were you affected by this? I mean, I, do you come in and under the new visa regime? What, did you find it easy to move to London? So uh, you see, uh, myself, maybe I'm not such a good example uh, because I'm, I'm not new to uh, UK in general. Yeah, so so uh, I, I, I was working there before. I, I had a few companies there before. Uh, th that I was running and all the stuff. So, so you know, I have a social insurance number and everything uh, there. So, <laughs> so uh, it's it's not something very special, uh, new to myself, uh, as 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 the thing. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, you see, I, I really don't think that uh, uh, the kind of uh, mm, there there will be some uh, let's say problems or limitations for uh, at least uh, in, in investors. Uh, and, and the company founders uh, to do the business in, in UK and, and to come to UK. Yeah? So we, at least from, from Europe and, and European countries. And this uh, really uh, smooth process on, on uh, at least from what I hear, uh, like now, uh, it, it is a smooth process. Of course, uh, myself and, and uh, uh, 
uh, and, and, and people I know, they, they went through this uh, earlier and uh, through, through totally different, uh, different regime itself. But uh, <clears throat> what maybe I would like uh, to, to, to point here is that um, uh, the, the, the thing is that, that actually um, Jemima touched uh, very good is that the regulatory regime in general in UK was the leading regime in, in, in Europe. Yeah? And that, that's why it is the, the uh, financial capital. And, and that, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, what we will see is that when it is a bit of separated from uh, European regime as such, um, it, it will be even again uh, just drive the, the uh, industry and, and drive the standard. Uh, and and uh, the here uh, will be the main driver, to be honest, on 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 uh, making fintech happen there, and and uh, uh, other financial institutions, institutions, and and other players like um, supporting those uh, establishing in UK. So and that will be the main driver, and all the rest of the things like you know uh, how to get into UK visas and all this stuff it, that will be not so important, to be honest. But. If you can IPO more easily, quicker here. Of course, yeah. So, so you will, you will do that. Yes, for sure. Jemima, continue down your list. Yeah. I mean, but this is the thing, isn't it? Like you know, the balance between light touch and being kind of um, overly uh, kind of. Um, what's the you word? You can be I'm Singapore, but you can't be Malta. Let's be real. Right, <laughs> exactly. And we're already being singled out as like there are stories in the last couple of days about. You know our tax, are, you know the fact that we're basically a tax haven, <laughs> and like in a post-Brexit world, that's I don't know. I've seen a couple of stories saying that that might become an issue. I mean, I don't know. I think I think we have to be careful in the amount, the extent to which we um, have this light touch attitude. And I already personally feel that, as we've discussed here before, that some of our regulatory treatment of fintech is too light touch. Um, but I think that will be a theme, you know, I think a massive global theme in the next 10 years, which kind of comes into this list in various ways today, I guess, is just like, how much is tech going to be allowed to like carry on, um, you know, creeping into like every area of our life, like how much are regulators going to let technology continue as it has been doing? Well, hang on. I mean, I, I, talk to Leighton about this, and I wanted this to be really upfront because it's a huge issue in the US, but it's a huge issue with giant tech, with the yeah. fangs, with the gaffers. That's yeah. one thing. But at the same time, surely the regulatory environment ha can clamp down on big tech, but it has to encourage small tech, doesn't it? Well, yes, but, but then you get issues like we're just about to discuss in China, which is like, Alibaba, Alipay, that was small tech at that one stage, you know, that was like, um, you know, and, 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 and I mean, look at all the like the way in which like peer to peer companies have been clamped down upon in, in China. Um, I don't know, I think there's like in China, I think we're almost seeing like a similar thing that you saw um, in like the 1990s in the US with like dot com companies just like being given like free reign to, to scale and to grow, but then suddenly, you know, Suddenly now regulators are in China saying, actually, no, you've you're you've got far too much influence. We don't want you to have that influence. And so yes, so like maybe, I mean, I actually think that there is an issue in being light touch on small companies as well. Like small companies can defraud their um their customers just as much as big companies can. They might not be able to be as systemically important or whatever, but um they can still do bad well, stuff. And I think you have yeah, I don't. I, I, I have to say, Jemima, I don't agree that the regulators in the UK are light touch. I don't think I've met anyone in fintech that would say that. I think mm. actually the key thing is making sure that we're applying the same standards to big tech or big financial services and fintech and small fintech, right? And I, I think that's really important. And I think you know, if you talk to regulators and policymakers, most of them will get that. But that's a really easy, you know and you need to enable and, and encourage innovation. The hard bit is how you do that, right? Because, and this, you know, I suppose I've been looking at regulation of tech and digital for, you know, as we discussed 30 years, and actually through all the different things, dot com boom, all of these sorts of things, you see different jurisdictions adopting different approach. You're right, the US adopted what they called the do no harm approach, as you may recall, 
you know, where they basically said to big tech, as long as you don't do anything that's really stupid, you know, you know, we'll, we'll let you go. They haven't applied that to fintech. And there's lots of people in the US that would like them to do that. I think by and large, we have, adult, you know, I think the FCA is well respected as a regulator around the world. And I think Ludas, that was what you were saying there. You know, I, I do think we by and large get this right. We don't always get it right. But I think the, the break from Europe does allow, and the UK FinTech review is, is sort of much broader than the, the two things that we talked about, you know, and I won't, won't go into that because we need to wait on the report. But what it will, you know, it will have various suggestions for what we can do that will enable, truly enable innovation, competition, all the things that we want, you know, and, and you know, there's another question one could ask is, does regulation actually enable innovation? Right. Well, that's, I mean, this yeah, is, that's, this, that's also a really interesting question. And that's part of their mandate, I think, is to is. encourage comp competition and innovation. Yeah. But I, 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 I feel that, that, that sometimes the balance is a bit off and, and, and is kind of not putting customers and market integrity first and is instead focusing on that competition and innovation in some some ways. And I think this will be more the case post Brexit is, is kind of the FCA acts as a kind of, um, you know, advertisement for like doing business in the UK rather than as a regulator. It's almost like acting as the body that advertises the UK being open for business. Um, which is all very well, and like you know, there are benefits to that. But I, but I, um, I think, for example, I've talked before about regulatory sandboxes, and I think there are some dangers inherent in those. And obviously, the FCA has pioneered those. Um, but 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 sure, like definitely, the UK is seen um, as a model. But that's partly because we've we've we have become the fintech capital of Europe, and we are doing quite well in terms of tech investment. Um, and, and and innovation, um, and so I can see that. But I but I think that there, there are also some some lapses, um, and you know there are kind of countless examples that I can think of that I've kind of written. You know, for one one's a company called ePayments that I've written about that's that um, basically had all its accounts frozen in February, and they've still not unfrozen them, and all the people using them who don't really get to. I actually need to do another story then because on them because you know the, most of the people using them are like the, the sex industry like you know online sex industry and gambling and stuff so they're not really people whose voices get listened to very much but actually it's really bad what's happened to them and the fca kind of is at fault like the fca shouldn't be punishing the customers the fca allowed this business to operate and has done nothing to to help these these like Anyway, so I think I think I'm not saying that the FCA is like the worst regulator in the world. I'm just saying I think there are some issues, and I think that that balance between being like fostering innovation, like I'm not sure whether that should be part of a regulator's mandate. But I mean, okay, continue down your list, or we're okay. Not so China, China. So we kind of touched on this. Um, so basically, in in what I've just said, because I do think it is like a big theme, and I think it's really interesting because you know we we have seen Alibaba and then Spus and spun out of that, like become these, ma and, and Tencent become these massive um, companies in, in China and, you know, the envy of the rest of, of the world, in particular the US. And suddenly, um, and, and, and also, you know, they've been seen as, you know, highly like people have been really keen to invest in them um, because it has seemed that the state, the Chinese state has been really supportive of them and has just let them flourish. But suddenly, well, not suddenly, I think it's been a kind of gradual process of Chinese regulators, PBOC, kind of basically clamping down. First of all, they stopped their IPO, like, was it a day before it went ahead? Which is kind of crazy. I think tech, um, shares in Ant have, uh, sorry, in Alibaba have fallen like 25% since. Um, since then and, and clearly I think this was meant to be the biggest IPO ever it was meant to be like a was it 35 billion IPO valuing it at like 300 billion which is like making it one of the biggest companies in the world not quite the Apple's one trillion but but probably about three times more I think than Goldman Sachs you know a massive 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 company that the 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 regulatory action that stopped the IPO and that we're now seeing continuing is going to affect the valuation. Like there's no question that it will, that it can, can and, and we've got people kind of saying that in this story that we've got on our list. There's no question that, that, that the kind is of- Is this an attack on Jack Ma or is it more broadly an attack on the FinTech world or the world of tech? I, mean, I think it's both. I think it's more, I think it's more broad. I think it's, I think it's about, 
Um, the have fact the Chinese that, gone after other big companies which are not associated? That's with- a really good question, and I don't know the answer. Um, I don't think so far, right? But I know that shares in Tencent have also fallen a lot since since then. So, like, there's definitely a sense that this isn't a Jack Ma thing, that this is like China clamping down on these massive, massive fintechs that have, or tech companies as they like to call themselves, even though they're operating like financial companies. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, so, so basically they are trying to, they're, they're trying to, they've got this rectification drive um, that, that um, they're basically, they're, they're going to be, and is going to be carving out a new financial holding company that's going to be regulated by the PBOC. Um, and it will basically bring them directly under the thumb of regulators. Um, uh, and the PBOC have like rebuked Ant saying that it's um, turning a blind eye to compliance regulate, uh, requirements. Um, and one former regulator said the best solution is to break up Ant into a finance unit for its online lending, brokerage and insurance businesses that will be under full regulatory oversight and a less regulated technology and data unit. Does this make uh, sense to you, John? Yeah, so... I, so we, we we ran a fintech conference, I remember, about two or three years ago, and we had an in-house lawyer from one of these big companies, not the ones that you've mentioned, Jemima. And it, it was asked him, do you think China needs a sandbox? And he said, we don't need a sandbox in China because we don't have any rules. The way it <laughs> happens in China are there are no rules on fintech, but that they said, which is a good thing. But the bad thing is the Chinese government could change them overnight, mm-hmm. literally publish legislation and implement it overnight. And so you're right. I think the fin- fintech hasn't particularly been treated in the same way that financial services. But you know, within Europe, right, and within UK, we're used to that being the case because you know we're we're very much a I suppose regulated on activity base. You know, and if you think things like you know PSD two, right, that the whole idea was to bring those companies doing kind of uh, e money, you know, and payments into into the sphere, the, the similar sphere to the banks. So um, I think you're. Right. I think the Jack. I think this is more mainly targeted at Jack Ma because of the comments he made. But I, 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 it may be part of a wider thing. And you know, China is. Well, China is very different, isn't it, in terms of the way it does regulation? Let's put it that way. Yeah. Lucas, you, your your view on this? I mean, uh, presumably you have links with Chinese entrepreneurs. Are they running scared of the government in, in terms of a, a broader crackdown on tech? So you see, uh, uh, of course, yeah, we we, we have, and, and uh, the, there are some entrepreneurs, you know, running the businesses here and, and actually like trying to set up the uh, European businesses out of China. Yeah? So, and and that's um, uh, with with the situation with the with the Jack Ma and, and all this uh, part is actually yes more related with Jack Ma and his, his comments. Uh, and on the other hand. Uh, uh, we all understand how uh, this this uh, government works and how it is controlled in in general. Yeah. So and uh, with the IPO, actually, uh, Alibaba just went too far. Yeah. So and and uh, uh, that had to be done before. You know, the, the splitted business with the financial business and and the tech business itself, and then he they they could go the uh, for the IPO. And uh, with how how the business was structured, they just went too far, and and uh, everyone was just like waiting when the government will stop that because when uh, the companies are becoming uh, you know uh, in in bigger power than than it's um, uh, than the, the government itself then of course uh, it, it creates a threat and uh, especially with the with the uh, countries like like China you know so um, and and uh, it's it's more related with the uh, how it was like structured and how the business operates in China in general, and uh, and and it's it's more about that to be honest, uh, and uh, and of course uh, that's why uh, this uh, movement of money um, and investments from China in, into different countries in UK a lot uh, in the European Union as well. Uh, and um, it, although they have this really big control and on the uh, on on the currency exchange and and, and currency movement w- uh, from China and to China, uh, but uh, there, there's lots of movement uh, out of China and investments made uh, of the Chinese companies in European Union and and UK uh, just to keep their funds safe and and to try to keep their business going on. Okay, Jemima, we need to keep going down the list. Sure. Okay, so the next thing on the list is um, Elon Musk officially being the richest man on earth. 
um, what a lovely man to, you know, so deserving. <laughs> Actually ties in slightly to um, one thing I hadn't mentioned on the, on the ant uh, story, which is that poor Jack Ma, literally poor Jack Ma, because obviously Alibaba owns 30% of, um, of ant and, and Jack Ma is major main shareholder in Alibaba and Alibaba shares, as I say, have fallen by a quarter. So poor Jack Ma has now only got $50.9 billion. He's lost almost $10 billion and he's only got 50.9 billion, which, you know, I don't know how he's going to keep going on that. Anyway, Elon Musk having also as the biggest shareholder in Tesla um, is now worth a hundred, well, as of like a week ago, I think it's actually higher now. Um, it probably around the same, but, but, um, he, so he's overtaken Jeff Bezos and he's worth $188.5 billion, which is completely normal. Um, and, uh, Jamie, who I wrote this story with, um, pointed out that, um, what he's worth is exactly double of all of Tesla's revenues since it started in 2008. He's worth double every single car that Tesla has sold ever. And Tesla's is, market cap. Kind of crazy. Is greater, it's greater than the market cap of General Motors, Ford, Honda, uh, Volkswagen, Mercedes, and uh, Hyundai, I think by a factor of about 30%. Yeah. Uh, it is madness. I mean, one wonders if madness. in real terms, in inflation-adjusted terms, he is the richest person the world has ever known. I'm oh, God. Yeah. About that. Yeah. Move on. We, we may envy him. Just move on. Do we? I don't. Jesus. I mean, yeah, I'm not I envy really. him. Yeah, Did sure. He? You want to be that rich? I think it would be awful to be that rich, personally. But anyway. <laughs> I'd rather be that rich than this poor. Oh, Andrew, you don't look too Keep poor. Going. Um, so um, here's another. Here's a story about one of Britain's entrepreneurs who didn't. Yes, quite. Mike Lynch. A great um, guy. We have done a couple of dinners with Mike Lynch. He's a great guy. I'm in favor of him. Really? Mm -hmm. So yep. what do you think about these fraud charges? I think that I've forgotten what her name was. What was her name at uh, Hewlett Packard who screwed up and looked for somebody to blame? I don't know. What was her, the, the woman who ran Hewlett Packard um, when they bought Autonomy? And I don't know. Autonomy simply wasn't as it's good. Before my time, I was at university at the time. <laughs> I was I was unaware yeah, of talk about the extradition process. Do we extradite yeah. people to the US or not? So yeah, so Boris Johnson has refused to get involved in this, but it's and um, but basically five um, former cabinet ministers have, or was it four? Anyway, uh, several five former cab cabinet ministers wrote to the time saying that um, that the UK has surrendered sovereignty um, over the over these extraditions. So basically, the U the US is trying to extradite. Mike Lynch. It's an um, asymmetrical extradition treaty. To me, it seems I mean, I have 100. no idea if John can talk on this or not. It seems completely the case that it's completely asymmetrical and that we are just like pandering to whatever they they want. And this kind of was set up this treaty in the in the wake of uh, of like 9-11, I guess it was set up in 2003. You know, Tony Blair lapping, you know, George Bush's you know, whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, it seems completely imbalanced as far as I'm concerned. But Boris Johnson and these five five um, former cabinet ministers were four Tory ministers, but also um, Vince Cable. They say the British legal system is quite capable of dealing with this case. The government cannot stand by as another Britain risk being delivered like this to the US justice system. And on the other, and in the US, they have um, uh, a woman, Anne Sekoulas, Who's this woman who who got who pleaded in, uh, diplomatic immunity mm -hmm. for killing this um, nineteen year old by driving up the wrong side of the road for twenty seconds? Um, so you can see that there's a kind of like um, imbalance. I would I, I I I would. I have no idea if Hogan Lovells has a view on this or if John can talk on. I, I it, it's not something that I I, I know very much about to, to to have a view. So I'm sorry. We'll move on. We'll move okay. on. Okay. 
Uh, FCA reminds financial firms of their responsibilities after Brexit. Um, I think I think this is just a kind of we don't have to talk too much about this. The FCA is basically just telling financial companies that there's new red tape. They're also talking about the what we discussed, what we kind of briefly touched on earlier, that there's this temporary permissions regime, which means that um, uh, if you've notified the FCA, you can have temporary access to passporting rights, which enables you to kind of have this frictionless um, uh, way of doing business with like the EU. I'm not quite sure how long that will go on for, um, that kind of extension. Uh, but apparently um, there's the FCA is saying that, that the extent to which UK firms can continue to provide services to customers in the European economic area depends on local law and local regulators' expectations. Um, and apparently, well, Jane, isn't this? I mean, let me ask John on this. It's basically asymmetrical. We're letting people in on a on a temporary basis, but the Europeans can do what they like. I mean, they have no, they don't have the same commitment to let UK companies in as we do to let European companies in. The passporting rights is about us doing business. It's not about letting them in here, right, John? It, yeah, it's about, oh, yeah, it's about it's about us being able to. Yeah, it's it's using, but that that has a limit, and you know. Obviously, when the Brexit Treaty, well, the when the when when all of these arrangements were were pushed, as you know, we were trying to get financial services within within that remit. That hasn't succeeded. You know, we've got nothing. We've got a hard Brexit, um, at least in that regard. So we are, to some extent, awaiting equivalence decisions and discussions. But you know, we none of us know what's going to happen with that. And right. and obviously it, it, it's it's slightly stressful for, for all concerned. Um and an equivalence is not really a great solution for us in the UK. I mean really. the point is that it's not agreed at the present time. I mean, no, you know, not. there isn't a blanket right to passport into the European Union even on a temporary basis, is there? There's well, there's this there's a temporary arrangement as per the FCE, but that I think it's six months, I think. Um, but I'd, but you know, yeah. it, it does depend where we get to, Andrew. But it seems to me, question. Andrew, that the, the the benefit is for us, not not vice versa, mm -hmm. isn't it? Well, we have unilaterally made concessions, in my understanding. But in the past, okay, I, I actually yeah, I don't know about enough about that. That was my understanding that we that it was kind of in our benefit somehow. But um, shall I move on? Yes. Okay, uh, so this is just a little thing from Twitter um, showing some, some data from the UK's, um, the government's future fund, which is this fund that it set up um, in, you know, post COVID to provide loans to um, SMEs um, from 125,000 to 5 million, um, but they need to be matched equally by private investors. And they've now approved almost a billion pounds worth of um, convertible note, loan notes to 971 startups. Um, this is a Twitter thread from Amy Lewin, who's the, I think, deputy editor of Shift at Sifted now, um, pointing out that there were 1,400 applications since the scheme launched. So it's a 68% hit rate. Um, in other words, 68% success rate of, of applicants get the loans. But she also points out that that is matched by private investment. So it's not like going to a private investor for a loan without anything. So um, you would expect that, I guess. Uh, she also makes some points about... <laughs> about the gender and 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 racial makeup of the management teams i don't really share her outrage <laughs> that um i mean because some of these companies might be tiny so she's saying that it's really embarrassing that 34 percent went to all white management teams and it's like but maybe there's like four of them and like is that really terrible that you have four white people or four men or like four black people or four anything of the same kind like you know if it's a really small company I'm not really someone who feels that you need diversity in every single, I mean, and also, I mean, that's, it's actually something I'm interested in because, well, I mean, that's a whole other conversation, to be honest. I'm not going to launch into that. But um, Leighton has a, has a thought on this. 68% uh, uh, application, uh, as Jemima mentioned, is very high. Um, but what was interesting to me was that it was across 971 startups. So, the government's got a stake in 970 companies um, and also there's more to come because you know I'm sure there'll be a flurry before the um, the deadline at the end of January so it's a it's mm. it's a seven seven hundred million more spent on this than intended I wonder what the hit the the um, the hit rate in terms of successes yeah 
Yeah, I mean, Gus, do you have a, a view on the future fund? I mean, I assume that you haven't been able to qualify for it. No, so we we, we didn't. Yeah, so I, I to be honest, I didn't uh, even uh, like uh, dig dig deeper on that. Is that are you aware of other countries with similar future funds, um, and and also this idea that they will the government will actually end up with stakes across the industry? So I I am familiar actually, and and we we have uh, you know uh, we have different schemes uh, across Europe, and uh, you know to be honest, uh, we also have quite a few companies in in different uh, in different countries. It's just uh, you know. Uh, from our side, uh, let, 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 let's just be very transparent, you know, uh, at least from, from my company and my side, uh, the impact of COVID and everything was just positive, not negative. And uh, we didn't uh, even look at that direction, you know, to, to have any kind of interaction with the governments or supports or loans or whatever. Uh, yeah, so, so and, and we didn't waste any like our energy or time on this. Uh, in general, uh, the schemes, uh, you know, for the support and and uh, and and uh, for the loans or sometimes uh, subsidies or whatever uh, provided uh, by the government to 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 the local companies are needed. Of course, uh, the the most important part is just to to avoid the frauds uh, on on that. Yeah, so that uh, that all the all the uh, support. Uh, uh, that that the government gives, and then either it's a mechanism of loan, and and then some uh, having some uh, part in in the company or whatever type of uh, uh, of support is that <clears throat> that uh, that it would be just provided for the companies that really needs that, because otherwise uh, we will have um, a bit of the impact uh, for uh, just changing the landscape, let's say in the market. And uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes it might actually have the opposite effect uh, on 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 the uh, on the competition level. So, so it's only it's only about that, to be honest. But uh, I don't see uh, any problem on government having a stake in uh, in in whatever uh, kind of company uh, until until it is uh, it is transparent mechanism on on uh, distributing that money. Jemima, should I move on? Yeah, uh, unless yeah. John wants to come in on this. No, that's fine. So the next story is uh, is not particularly fintech, but I think this might have been your edition, Andrew. Twitter versus Trump has been big tech gone too far. Well, it uh, has to do with with the, yeah. uh, the crackdown on. Absolutely. On well, yeah, it's part of this broader theme, isn't it? Like you know, well, as the as as the headline asks, has big tech gone too far? Um, so anyway, so Trump is now banned not only from Twitter and Facebook, but from a whole <laughs> array of platforms. Some of which one does wonder whether he would really have tried to use Pinterest, like you know. And also, some platforms have themselves been deplatformed. Parler. Parler, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Parler is is this um, app that people were using a lot, um, kind of a lot of the kind of far right nutters who 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 organised um, uh, this attack on the Capitol, for example, were using it. Um, and um, so it's now been deplatformed in the sense that um, you can't access it uh, via Google, but also um, its servers were actually being hosted by Amazon Web Serv uh, Services, which is the biggest um, cloud-based uh, platform in the world that a lot of our technology kind of runs off of. Um, and they now are no, no longer um, are willing to serve them, although obviously there are lots of other cloud platforms that, that could, I guess. Um, so there's been a lot of debate about this, about like the, um, whether or not this is an overstep of, of, um, you know, of technology. Oh, clearly it was, it was, it was of, of big tech companies. I mean, sorry, clearly it was, um, it was triggered by, I mean, we, we had after the vote, if you remember, there were all these warnings that like Trump's tweets about the election being rigged and, and about like, you know him having won the election, etc., were were not were not accurate. Didn't have any evidence for them and everything. So that was the kind of start, I guess, on Twitter. And then they banned him for 24 hours, and now he's just fully banned. But yeah, so the trigger, I guess, was was last week's um, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> um, terrorist attack coup. I mean, I personally wouldn't call it either of those things. The question is whether these are these platforms are publishers, in which case they're liable right. for 
what yeah. is on them or yeah. are they platforms that have no responsibility for what goes on them they want well, to have yeah. it both ways a lawyer they want to have it both ways again exactly. i don't know if hogan lovell has a position on this but uh, yeah but well, I, the, yeah it's it's very it is really interesting andrew as you see and obviously you know there's a lot of reforms going in both in the uk and the eu at the moment you know you've got the digital services act you've got all the online harms bill and you're absolutely right tech platforms are increasingly becoming liable and policymakers regulators are targeting them for saying you know to the extent that there's harmful that that people f suffer e.g a physical harm or you know or um or, or or some form of harm then the platform will be liable uh, it's very interesting to be you know i've been speaking to my us colleagues as you can imagine about this one of whom i was speaking to the other day said yeah i i live a mile away from the capitol building and their some of their views are are you know Twitter, you know, et cetera, have no right to do this. And others are saying, this is incitement of violence. It's too much. They're, they're a private company. They're perfectly entitled to do this if that's what they want. I, I think, the re I mean, I, you know, speaking about the AWS parlor thing, which I thought was very interesting as well, as I understand it, AWS, and I, I'm not close to this, but AWS did give repeated warnings to Parler about breach of terms of service and they didn't do anything about it and they just said enough is enough mm. you know and you know and it's not like Trump hadn't been warned either is certainly what, what others have said you know Trump had been temporarily banned and he'd been warned and he's you know uh, for fact checking etc but I think the tip over point certainly for many people that I've spoken to in the US has been the fact that it you know it caused violence right because I think People take obviously the Fifth Amendment, you know, very seriously. Um, but they, you know, and you can pretty much say what you want. Um, but if it leads to incitement of violence, then that that really takes you well, over. Uh, yeah, but obviously on the other side, I mean, the 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 right wing websites are pointing out that uh, Twitter and Facebook and so on did not ban any of the Antifa. Um, posts yep. that were made at the time of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so there I is think it's a really dangerous asymmetry. Yeah I, it, yeah, I think there's massive asymmetry and I think it's a really slippery slope. And like, if you're going to ban... How does a millennial like you feel about it, Jemima? I don't like it, but I'm not really representative of, of millennials. Like, I don't agree with lots of my friends. Like, most of my friends are about, you know, 10 times woker than I am. So I, I'm not sure I'm representative. I'm, I don't really go for this. Um, I don't know if you ever saw this, this Twitter thread by Barry Weiss when she quit the, the New York Times um, over the, uh, the op-ed that was written about sending the troops. And she made this distinction between... I think um, the old generation, which I think she might have said was over 40. In other words, basically generation X, the one above, the one just before millennials and then millennials and I gen or, or generation Z but below them. And um, there's a book actually that I'm reading, listening to on Audible at the moment called The Coddling of the American Mind, which is which I'd recommend, which does talk about um, what they call safetyism and the sense that emotional safety is the kind of primary concern that we should have and that that's much more important than freedom of speech and other kind of civil li liberties. So anyway, um, she kind of talked about that being the um, the generational gap, but I, I would say I, I don't really fit into my generation. So for me, I'm, 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 I'm really not for it. I, I, um, I think it's a slippery slope. Like if, if you're going to not allow, and it's clearly so politicized, like it's, it's, it's just, it's far too politicized. And it's, it's, it's like the big, big tech have kind of consistently, I guess, since they were blamed, I think probably slightly unfairly for basically Trump in 2016, they've massively gone in the other direction. They're mostly right, you know, the West Coast, Silicon Valley lot, they're not, you know, they're mainly kind of Elon Musk is an exception, actually, but they're mainly... Peter Thiel is the exception. Democrat, sorry. Peter Thiel is the ex exception. He is the only yeah, tech who voted... Republican, I think. Yeah, Peter Thiel, but he's hasn't he gone rogue? Isn't isn't he even not? Doesn't he? I think he doesn't even live in Silicon Valley anymore, does he? I think he's like he's Texas or something. <laughs> I could have that wrong, but he's anyway. Yeah, um, it's clearly politicized. I don't know where the line is drawn. Like, what about WhatsApp? Like, loads of of conspiracy theories are shared to me even on WhatsApp. Like, you know, are we going to ban WhatsApp because like, except no, because WhatsApp is Facebook. So like, WhatsApp is big tech. 
So like, but but what makes WhatsApp so much better than Parler? Just because like, okay, Parler was particularly, and, and, and you know, what about Signal? And, and because Signal is a, is a place that people go because it's encrypted and people trust it. Like, where is the line? And I think it's a very slippery slope. Right. Um, yeah. Ludas, do you have a view on slippery slopes? Yeah, so I would totally agree, you know, with uh, uh, with you, and uh, uh, it, it, it's it's really uh, it's it's really a bad example, actually, and and I think it, it just went too far. So uh, it had to be either uh, it had to be either some kind of I don't know law uh, you know court decision or whatever uh, to to just ban this account or just not to pay the attention uh, then to it and 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 leave it because either they're a publisher taking the full responsibility of all the content. Uh, yeah. so either they are not paying attention to any of, of the content and uh, this like the choice of what to ban and not uh, I believe that it's, it's really not a good example and, and really not a good direction to move okay they're also, they're also like taking complete liberties with like you know nowadays on Twitter like if you if you want to retweet something like I <laughs> Izzy tried to retweet her own article and she was she was given a um, a, uh, a prompt you know a pop-up have you read this? You might want to read this article before retweeting it. Twitter, have you have you got that now? I don't know if you've had it. I've had that on Twitter where they're like, you might want to read this before you retweet it. And it's like, excuse me, but like I get to decide that. You don't get to tell me like I wrote the article or whatever. You know, so it's it's creeping into our lives. Uh, I actually wrote, there's a, there's a, I'm going to say one last thing before I move on. There's a <clears throat> an opinion column I wrote that's gone out today that I wrote will be in the paper tomorrow on uncertainty and the fact that we undervalue and under reward people who express uncertainty and and over reward those who, who speak with conviction and overconfidence and the thing that actually inspired this is on microsoft outlook which i don't use but i saw someone else on twitter say something about it if you this guy on twitter he'd written oh this he's a science journalist actually very good one he'd written um this this shows cut and he'd written the words kind of and Microsoft underlined it as it would a grammatical error and said, words expressing uncertainty limit your impact. And then I started looking it up and I saw other people who'd, who'd made the same, like who'd pointed this out on Twitter as well. It does it with the words probably, perhaps, almost, um, basically. Anyway, so but what, what it's doing is, is in, like it's decided, Microsoft has decided that like we should all be talking with in this confident way, even about things that we're not confident about. I don't really, I don't really go, and it, we should all be talking in this kind of corporate speak, like, you know, women are always told, don't say sorry, you know, be more confident, be more like men. No, I don't buy into that. So I think that the, the way that, that tech creeps into our lives increasingly is quite alarming and i do think it's a theme as i say and like the the kind of how we deal with these because clearly we are, we're all really reliant on them increasingly so and clearly we all like them to a certain extent but that getting that balance right i think is is uh, oh, very, very encouraging in in defense of doubt move on <laughs> exactly in defense of doubt that's what it was uh so now we're on to a section on cryptocurrency we haven't really got very long have we god um, the, the, the first story on this list is uh, my story. Um, it was just, I'm so sick of seeing people talk about the market cap of Bitcoin. Um, and people got very excited because clearly there's been a massive rally in Bitcoin in recent weeks. Um, haven't checked the latest price, but I think it's around 38,000. You know, 38,000. 34,000 actually it fell yesterday. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's fallen a bit. It's about uh, 30, 39, 39 earlier on. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. It's quite volatile yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is one reason that i like to point out that it's not exactly digital gold anyway um uh so uh people like to say basically there was a big there was a lot of excitement because suddenly according to to it to, to that price if you multiply that by the number of bitcoins that have been mined you basically get an insanely high number like 400 billion i think um which makes bitcoin um, you know, the ninth biggest asset in the world. And this is comparing it to companies for some weird reason, because I guess people see Bitcoin as a bit like buying a Bitcoin is a bit like, well, not a Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin is a bit like buying a stock. So it's seen in the same way. So, it's, so we're talking about market cap, even though it's a completely absurd metric to use for Bitcoin. And the reason, as I point out in this piece, there are a few. One is that 18.4 or however much it is Bitcoins have been mined. It doesn't mean that that's how many are actually in circulation. A huge number of them, you might have seen a story in the New York Times this week about this guy called Stefan Thomas. Have you seen this? Yeah. Yes. Who, 
who this guy who's lost, is it 20 millions worth? I understand that he, in the story, I think it says that 15% of Bitcoins that have been mined yeah. have actually been lost. lost. No, I think, well, different people have different numbers. I, I've seen 20%. But uh, it's, it's all these I personally know people who lost, lost nothing and yeah. people lost their passwords. Yeah. So this is a massive issue. And so this guy, Stefan Thomas, has lost like 20, 20 he's, he's got two more tries, hasn't he? And he says he's yeah. lying in bed thinking like, what could it be? <laughs> Poor guy. Um, so I mean, uh, J- John, John is, um, is less of a Bitcoin skeptic. I mean, Jemima is a well-known Bitcoin skeptic. <laughs> You are you are not as skeptical. You you believe there is a, a business case behind it. I, I believe there's a there's definitely a business case behind behind crypto assets. You know uh, whether Bitcoin will ultimately be a useful crypto asset, I think remains to be seen. But I'm definitely a believer in kind of digital assets. I mean, one could argue whether they will be cryptographically secured, right, and whether there will be crypto assets. But I definitely believe in in digital assets for sure. Um, makes sense to me that you that you have digital assets for in a digital world. We already do though. Like the pound is a digital asset, was a digital currency. Yeah, but it's not that easy to move around. You know, in but it a way, shouldn't it, be. It shouldn't be like that's the whole point. Like it shouldn't be that easy because we don't want people to launder their money. We don't want them to evade capital controls if there are con- capital controls in we place. Can, we can still have, I think, a much better digital asset that still has KYC, AML. Um, I mean, I, I think. But could that be, I think why, why not a government issued? Um, well, that uh, may be that may be where we, that that's the debate, right? Is it government issued? And actually, you know, uh, Leighton and I were discussing this earlier on, right? Do you do you have do 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 we as citizens trust a government more? Do we trust big tech more? Um, you know, who who do we trust? You know more, and and this is this is the big debate about stable coins and why regulators and policymakers are very stressed about it. Um, There's so much to say on this, but I know we haven't got much time. There, um, there, there, let me there give is. Ludas just a chance to come in because um, Lithuania, I'm sure, is absolutely awash with cryptocurrencies. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, to be honest, I would like to have uh, you know another uh, another discussion about that uh, and and a separate one because <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm I went through different stages with the uh, with the crypto. You know, I was. Uh, I was really interested in those and 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 let's call it passionate a bit, uh, then uh, and, and curious. Uh, then uh, now I'm I'm more skeptic than than uh, optimistic to be honest. And uh, from my perspective, I also I just don't see a business case actually why we should need uh, to 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 keep our assets or something on the digital coin as such. Um, and and because of different reasons, and, and first of all, I, I really don't want uh, someone to be funded with my m- money to to buy guns or whatever, uh, and and uh, that's that's one of the core things. Uh, the other thing is about the sustainability itself and all uh, and everything. If if you if just to look uh, how much of energy is used uh, used now to uh, to get those uh, coins and 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 uh, to confirm the transactions. It's just massive numbers, uh, you know, of, of energy waste, uh, and, and it's not stable then anyway. Uh, and and uh, and about the you know asset side, uh, I, I really even wouldn't start talking about that because it's not an asset at all. So, uh, so, so from that perspective, uh, I, I'm not so, so optimistic uh, about that. Uh, and and there are quite a few issues. Also with having them, yeah. So I was I was really playing with the with the cryptocurrencies. Uh, I had uh, quite a long list of of uh, coins uh, because I just wanted to try, uh, and and I was really curious about that. Uh, I I've lost I think I don't know sixty percent of that uh, with that. Just you know, I really don't know whether how to open that those wallets now how to access that <laughs> now. Uh, and <laughs> some of them I do I do have that uh, and, and uh, st- still I have that. But uh, I, to be honest, I don't see a reason. <laughs> okay, five minutes. What else? Five minutes. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so, so I guess the next. I should also point out in the context of um, Bitcoin market cap that temporarily, I just went and checked, and it's been it's moved down. But temporarily today, just before we came on, actually, um, a new cryptocurrency called Wrapped Bitcoin had suddenly gone to the top of coin market cap which is the the website that tracks all these market caps 
and was suddenly worth four hundred quadrillion dollars. <laughs> By far the biggest thing, basically bigger than like world GDP, far bigger than world GDP. Uh, it's now number thirteen. So I don't know. Um, you know, people are just like this is this is the ridiculous nature of the crypto world, and people want to take want want it to be taken seriously. And coin market cap is is like a serious, you know, it's been bought recently by, is it Coindesk or, or Coinbase or some, some big company owns Coin? Which one is it? Coindesk, I think. Coindesk, yeah. Um, and they're publishing this stuff, you know, showing, saying that something's got a 400 quadrillion market cap. Yeah. You know, market cap is meant to express in some ways what the value is if someone were to like buy it out, you know, what would the shareholders have to be? I mean, it's insane. It's like saying, it's like saying, I'm going to sell you this hairband well, actually, it's not because I don't have. But but like, say it was. Say I said I was going to sell you this hairband for a pound, and then I said, okay, I've sold this one hairband for a pound, and I've got four hundred million hair, hairbands. Therefore, you know, I, I have a market cap of four hundred million. These hairbands are worth four hundred. Like you could just have to sell one, and then times it by however much. And because it's digital asset, you just press the button, and you have four hundred quadrillion. I mean, it's just ludicrous. But the thing is. You need these examples to show you how ludicrous the whole thing is because the other ones pretend they're not as ludicrous when when they are literally in the same position that you can just click the button. <laughs> but that's anyway. Uh, Ripple talking of ludicrous is being sued by the SEC. I won't go into all of that. We can maybe do that next time. So I feel like that's a bit tricky. But essentially, they are um, what they've always been criticised for is that they. But basically, X XRP, which is what they say is not Ripple. You know, they're very they're very disconnected because they're trying to get around securities laws. But the SEC are saying, uh, actually, no. And you did issue securities, and um, that's what XRP is. And it was a unregulated securities offering, and uh, there are all sorts of issues inherent in that. So that's that's I'll just gloss over that. Tether, as I mentioned earlier. Um, is uh, kind of back in the spotlight because two reasons. One, tomorrow there are some legal documents coming out related to a case that's brought against it by the New York um, Attorney General's Office, um, which is basically accusing them of, of, of fraud. Um, but basically, Tether is this stable coin um, that is supposedly backed one-to-one -one by dollars. It says that it is backed. Um, in court last summer, when it was uh, when this case was brought against them, they acknowledged that actually only 74% was backed by cash or cash reserves. The other 26% was backed by a loan to Bitfinex, which is I mean all these companies are incredibly shady. They're all linked to each other. All being I mean the the founder of Bitfinex is literally a guy who like started a load of Ponzi schemes. French guy. Um, Apparently this loan is good. They've uh, apparently they've honoured. They, they've already paid one of the instalments back early or something. This was this represented twenty six percent of all its assets last summer. Now Tether is worth something like twenty over twenty billion dollars, um, and so I guess that would be worth less of the total reserves. But they, basically they've never had a proper audit, so they say they're fully backed. There's questions over if you should be backed by, by that really um, risky loan anyway. But even the other 74% that, that they say is backed in cash and cash reserves, they've acknowledged that that includes Bitcoin. And I mean, you can't call Bitcoin cash, oh, sorry, cash or qu cash equivalents, um, which, as you can imagine, I mean, like when the Bitcoin price goes up, they basically can issue a whole load more t tethers because that's what they're backed in. So it feels like this kind of, um, you know, it's this this constant effect of like inflating the price. And basically, sorry, I'm rushing through it, so I don't know if I'm. Well, let me ask John because uh, let, because the, the you you um, you tread fairly with fairly heavy feet over all sorts of legal ground. Um, I think John is more <laughs> encouraged by stable coins than you are. Is that even correct? tether? Uh, so I so I you know if you look at the what the crypto. So I, there's quite a lot that you said, Jemima, that I probably disagree with. But what I will say is that there's, you know, the clients generally that we deal with take all this stuff very seriously and would agree with you. Actually, they want to be taken seriously. So we need to be do serious stuff. And I think it's it's really interesting. It's a bit like the kind of uh, the, the, the Twitter discussion. There's a real 50-50 split, I think, from the crypto community. You know, lots of them will say this XRP Ripple thing was inevitable. And I mm -hmm. think they think the tether thing 
ultimately would be inevitable because they don't think they're very serious. And I think the problem with Tether, if you look at their website, is they do not, I think you're right, they don't make clear what, there's no clarity to the consumer, which I think no is, is the, which I think is a very bad thing, right? I think we could probably all agree that's a very bad thing. There's no doubt that, I mean, if you look at the direction of travel, you know, the UK uh, consultation that went out last week, the EU consultation on, on Mika, stable coins are definitely under the spotlight from the regulators, and rightly so, because, you know, I think Bitcoin is one thing, and I think most, you know, I... Hopefully, just about all people understand that if you invest in Bitcoin, you might lose as well. But with things like stable coins, I think it's it, people might not realize that they could lose out on that. And I and I totally agree with you, Jemima, that people do need to know and people need that clarity. And you know, I think when Tether first started, it was all it was all you know it's all pegged to the dollar, and we're holding the same the the the, the same amount of dollars, right? And then that 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 seemed to at some point shift, right? Uh, yeah. But I'm not sure it was necessarily made that clear to the consumers, mm. which I, I think mean, is the fact the bad is thing. that the 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 if people if everyone tried to cash out their tethers, which no one ever does, no one ever cashes out their tethers because. Um, you, you, it's much easier to just do it via an exchange. And it's an incredibly good way of evading capital controls as well, tethers. I mean, th there's a reason that they're so popular, particularly in China. Um, and so the fact that, I mean, basically it's like the, um, in fact, this, 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 this article that I included in this, in this list, uh, which is by a kind of well-known tether and Bitcoin skeptic, so obviously it has to be viewed as such. Um, but you know, compares it to basically the financial crisis. Like it, we're building up this massive risk. It's it's worth over twenty billion dollars, and if everyone tried to cash out, there would be a massive liquidity crunch. And it's 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 worrying. I think I think that it'd be like a run on, it'd be like a, run on a bank, couldn't it? Yeah, but they, which which was where we were, which is where we were in two thousand eight, right? People were very well. Yes, but that's the problem. But but Tether is completely unregulated. So banks have now been been forced to, you know, banks had to be bailed out and they've now been forced to massively increase their, 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 their yeah, exactly, their capital. And even even before then, banks were regulated. Like, we don't know what Tether's doing. Like, we've literally got no idea how much is backed. They say it's 74% backed, including in Bitcoin, which is funny in itself and 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 really yeah. risky as far as I'm concerned. Like, what happens if the price of Bitcoin falls massively? Like, yeah, and that's um, where I think that's where I think the US have not got it right with crypto, um, because yeah. you know they will they're very harsh in terms of enforcement of regulation, but they're not actually being proactive, you know, and really tackling things like stablecoin the way they should. Which I think was one of the good effects of the whole Libra announcement. Right, was that everybody started to realize that this is actually going to be really risky to consumers and potentially systemically. So we need to tackle this. And I think mm. that that has been a good thing. Now we could debate what, what will ultimately happen in terms of stable coins and whether it should be in private hands or whether it should be a state backed currency or whatever. Right. And obviously, you know, in the UK bank of England is, is keen to potentially experiment on that, which I, I think would be good for the UK personally. But, um, uh, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that it should be regulated. Right. Okay. What are you up to over the next month? Quickly, um, Ludas first. What um, what should we be looking at over the next month? Uh, so uh, you see, so so we kind of uh, touched uh, very good the the the, the topics. Yeah. So uh, from like Brexit. Uh, so of course the uh, everyone is looking on clarity actually on the passporting things and 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 that part. Uh, and and I think. Uh, there should be some clarity uh, behind that because uh, we we didn't finish this this like talk uh, and and discussion about that. But yeah, the situation is that now it is extended for six month uh, you know period uh, with the passporting both sides. Uh, but but still the the final decision has to be or final decision has to be uh, agreement has to be made and uh, and then uh, for everyone like uh, to know how to operate yeah so for for the financial institutions uh, so that would be will be one of the topics uh, let's say from UK's perspective uh, <clears throat> and and to uh, keep an eye on that um, and of course uh, this the second uh, if if uh, looking uh, you know about the uh, cryptocurrencies and and that part, uh, I would say that uh, uh, also you know uh, let's say maybe not next month, uh, maybe it's it's a longer future, but uh, still there has to be a discussion see, on the regulation basically and on some kind of responsibility because the the biggest problem I see now with the cryptocurrency is that 
um, they don't serve for the reason they were actually invented to. Uh, so they, because they were invented on the crisis of the banking with, with the mission and vision to like uh, have the more stability in the financial system, but actually it appears that it does not have at all. And, uh, and that's the biggest, uh, and that's the biggest issue and, 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 and problem I see. And, uh, I believe that all these, uh, adjustments, let's say in the, in the pricing and of course, uh, on, on, you know, transparency, wise uh, they they have to appear because uh, just uh, otherwise it will not work and 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 it will have uh, just uh, just yeah uh, one one of the bubbles you know and and uh eating uh, uh this um you know extra money that people have <laughs> and, and then that's it so so that's that's my like you know you okay. can... john what are you looking at over the next month so we've got uk consultation and crypto which i think is, is from Treasury, which I think is is a very good document and interesting. And I think, you know, if we're if we're to be positive about um, where where that goes, that's really important for people to respond to. We've got the EU consultation uh, on crypto assets as well, um, and we've also, you know, and that EU digital finance package, which I think is very important as well. Um, but and we've got the UK fintech review we talked about earlier on, which will be published, you know, in 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 next month. So there's a I, I think you know I, I completely agree with, uh, with what Lidas was saying because basically I think we need to figure out in the UK what our direction is, right? Are we going to have this? Is there going to be something to do with the EU? You know, is there it, or are we going to go our own way? Um, I personally think you know to to Jemima's point of earlier on, you know, now that we've got Brexit, right? We've got they're going to be the best of it. But figuring out the right way is 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 hard as well. I don't have all the answers either, but it does give us the opportunity to do things better and faster than we could in within the EU. Because let's face it, it was slow and it wasn't always very good because of the you know as someone that has to interpret EU legislation and financial services, that's not a fun game. That's not <laughs> that's not a fun game for Christmas. Uh, it's often a very frustrating game. So I think we can actually you know this is. You know, I, I think we've got a fantastic opportunity to take the UK, you know, to really become a global leader in fintech. It's not all about regulation, but regulation, as Lita said, is important. You know, it's really important um, uh, to have that kind of uh, right balance between uh, between innovation. And I also agree with Jemima that you know, it, it there needs to be, you know, it needs to be rigorous enough, right? We don't, you, and no one. No one in fintech really wants cowboys, right? Everybody, you know, because you, you want the, you want the industry to be to have respect, and you want consumers to be happy. Last thing you need is a scandal, and but let's face it, not all scandals have been from small companies. Fintechs, right? Mano, the final word. We, we could have different different opinions on that because we we have uh, quite a few a huge banks and scandals. So, so exactly, well. exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's my point. Right. Wirecard, I, you know, Wirecard like likes to call itself a fintech, but that's pretty big. It was big, big yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. What am I working on? Well, I'm working on a tether piece actually for the paper. Um, I don't know. Other than that, I mean, you know, just whatever. Something happened. something will come up. Um, <laughs> somewhat chaotic, up. but a lot of things got discussed. Can I thank uh, Ludas? Uh, can I thank John? And as always, can I thank Jemima on behalf of my colleague Leighton and myself? And of course, thank all of you for watching. Many thanks. <laughs>